feet together using the wonderful text, the Robert Lowry text, How Can I Keep From Singing Your Praise? Obviously a little different setting. And then that wonderful uh, hymn, oh, How I Love Jesus. Let's stand together and sing our praise to the Lord. Let's sing. There is an endless song. There is an endless song echoes in my soul. I hear the music ring, and though the storms may come, I am holding on to the rock I cling. How can I keep from singing? That's your testimony this morning. I want to sing. Let's sing. I will lift my eyes in the darkest night, for I know my Savior lives, and I will walk with you, knowing you see me through, and sing the songs you give. Singing your praise, how can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart want to sing. I can sing in the troubled times, sing when I win. I can sing when I lose my step and I fall down again. I can sing because you pick me up, sing because you're there. I can sing because you hear me, Lord, when I call to you in prayer. I can sing. With my last breath, sing, for I know that I'll sing with the angels and the saints around the throne. How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your
your testimony this morning, your love, you want to sing about it. The guys are going to help us with a few uh, selected passages from from Psalms and uh, put a little Jesus in there with us, all right? Ain't no rock going to shout for me. Have a seat, please. question worth asking. 
If you don't have a good singing voice, should you, do you have a moral imperative to stop singing, to be quiet, so you don't bother the people around you? Well, I have a very strong conviction about this because I have one of the worst voices on the planet of the earth. I have made more musicians cringe than anybody I know in, in my whole life. I have a truly horrible singing voice. Although I have lining up my in my parents' bedroom perfect attendance choir statuettes from when I was a kid, it didn't do me any good. I still have a horrible singing voice. But the reality is God's Word tells us God inhabits the praises of His people. That whenever we are giving praise to Him, He pays attention. He doesn't just listen from a distance. He comes and He is with us. So I can't help it. I just have to sing those songs and hymns of praise to God. My wife says it's one of the most unique experiences on the earth to hear my cross medley when I'm in the shower in the morning. Just have to sing those praises to God. So it's not a matter of how well you sing. It's not a matter of what parts you hear. I try to hit as many different parts as I can. It really doesn't matter. I pick any old key I want to. It doesn't matter to me what the musicians pick. The important thing is that you praise the Lord. For when you praise Him, He will be there. And after all, I've got to be better than those old rocks crying out, don't I? There's got to be somebody or something with a worse voice than I have. The important thing, give Him praise so that He might be present with you. I'm going to ask Dr. Preston Nix to come. I just have to call on him to pray today. He came to us from a pastorate in Oklahoma. I'm amazed that our speaker came today uh, after I took him out of the state of Oklahoma. And uh, he's dearly missed there. But we're delighted to have Dr. Nix, who is our new director of the Level Center for Evangelism and Church Health and professor of evangelism and evangelistic preaching. Would you please lead us in a word of prayer? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you that you have made us to praise you, and you've given us voices to do so. We thank you, Lord, for making the difference in our lives. Lord, we are so grateful this day that we can sing, that we have voices. Lord, we thank you that we can be here together, and we thank you that you're here with us. And we thank you, Lord, for this worship experience today. Lord, we thank you for Dr. J and what he means to... Oklahoma Baptist and what he means to our convention and what he means to this seminary and what he means to his family and what he means to many pastors like me because of his love and care and concern. And I pray, Lord God, today that you'll just be all over him, that your spirit will speak through him, Lord, that he'll have a word to our hearts and you'll use it to help us to be in line with what you want for us to do and what you want us to know and Lord, I pray that you would allow us to be those kind of men and women that praise you with our lips and praise you with our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name, the name above every name. Amen. Amen. We want to make sure everybody's blood is circulating and you get all revved up for a great sermon to come. So let's just stand and shake hands with one or two people and just remind the people around you it's okay to sing and praise God. Would you do that? Thank you so very much. Thank you. Please be seated. We welcome you to this time of worship and praise on the campus of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. One of our wonderful uh, staff who's worked in our library for many years is Eric Benoy up here. Eric, wave at everybody. He's a pastor at Airline Baptist Church, and we have some of their senior adults who are here worshiping with us today. Let's just give them a hand and welcome them. This is the generation that built the cooperative program and made it the kind of entity that is right now paying 50% of the cost of your seminary education. Take your bill, multiply it by two, that's how much we'd have to charge you if it weren't for the cooperative program. We love senior adults. And we're so grateful for the great convention 
that you folks have built through your years of service to Jesus Christ. What a joy it is to have on our campus for our sermon for the day, Dr. Anthony Jordan, who is the executive of the Baptist Convention of Oklahoma. He has been in that role for a number of years. Before that, he was a very successful, very outstanding pastor. Before that, he was what you are, a student sitting on a pew at the campus of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, getting his education. Do you have any idea what God's going to do with you? I doubt if Dr. Jordan knew when he was sitting there where you're sitting that he would one day be the state executive for the state of Oklahoma. But God's done a wonderful work in his life as he plans to do with you. He took his seminary education seriously, but more than that, he took ministry seriously. Go back to every church he served and you'll see lost people won to Christ. You'll see missions highly promoted and a congregation mobilized for both financial support of missions and actual involvement in missions. And go to the state of Oklahoma and the the touch of Anthony Jordan with that heartbeat for evangelism and missions is absolutely unmistakable. This is a man who loves God, who loves his word, loves to preach, loves to tell people about Jesus. And we're just so delighted to have him on our campus today. And uh, Paula has uh, told me, his wife Paula is right over here. We welcome you, Miss Paula. And she's told me that this is one of the better sermons that she's written that he'll be preaching today. And so it's going to be a great message. Thank you so much for coming with him. You also need to know that Oklahoma Baptists have responded in a huge way to Hurricane Katrina. They have sent hundreds upon hundreds, probably thousands of people down to work in the strike zone. Uh, They brought one of the most popular things that ever showed up in the city of New Orleans to our campus, a shower unit for people to take hot and cold showers when there was no hot and cold shower. Oh, they love you who had those showers, Dr. Jordan. And Oklahoma disaster relief teams did everything, food preparation, mudding out, as well as that shower unit, they did so many things, and they are still coming to New Orleans two and a half years after the storm. To quote an ancient Hebrew expression, wow, that's pretty amazing. And we're awfully glad to have Dr. Anthony Jordan. Now let's turn our hearts towards worship before we open our Bibles for a word.
response to the Lord leading us. Let's sing together just the first stanza and refrain of that wonderful hymn, He Leadeth Me. He leadeth me, O blessed thought, O words with heavenly comfort fraught. Whate'er I do, where'er I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. Thank you. It is a joy to be with you today. Um, Paula and I were uh, thinking yesterday as we walked across campus that um, 30 years ago, May, I stood on this platform and got a terminal degree. And it nearly terminated me to get it, I promise you, as some of you are very aware. But it is always good to come back. I, um, I Every time I come back on campus, I think about... Uh, those who paid the price so that I might have the privilege of getting a first-class education here at New Orleans Seminary. And as I walk around, as I walk among you and, and look at um, those of you who are studying and those who are leading, I give thanks to God for this generation that we're talking about uh, this morning, uh, who across this nation give to the cooperative program through their churches. And uh, I go back to Oklahoma encouraged and excited to tell the story of the cooperative program to Oklahoma Baptist churches because of what God is doing at New Orleans Seminary. And we are proud as Oklahomans. I, I think at last count we have at least five of your profs who have connection to Oklahoma, for which I am very thankful. And it is a great joy for us as a state convention to invest in the work of God here at New Orleans Seminary. And yes, we are continuing to come. Had the privilege of giving, uh, uh, our people gave about a million and a half dollars to the Katrina, uh, and I never even announced that we were taking an offering. They started sending money immediately. And what a joy to see what God is doing in restoring this great uh, city, and particularly what he's done here at the seminary. Well, I only have a few minutes, so I want to get to business, all right? I want you to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, today I want to speak for a few moments about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. It is a doctrine that I believe that far too often in Baptist circles we have ignored to our own demise. Now I obviously don't have time to deal with the whole of that subject, so I'm going to zero in on only one text and one part of that doctrine. In the first chapter, the Apostle Paul speaks about the sealing of the Holy Spirit, that we are sealed at the day of redemption, until the day of redemption, when we come to know Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. Now, I like that. I'm, I'm a Baptist partly because of the fact that we believe in what is usually termed once saved, always saved. And I believe that because I am sealed throughout eternity in the Holy Spirit of God. That's in the first chapter. And then in the fourth chapter, he addresses the issue of grieving the Holy Spirit. Uh, I, I, as I think about that, I am troubled at the fact that in my own experience, there have been times in my spiritual journey when I have grieved the Holy Spirit of God. By the way, that gives you a perspective that he is really a person. He's not a thing or an it, but he's a person. I have the ability to grieve him by my actions. And then in chapter 5, he addresses the subject of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's where I want to pick up in the doctrine of the Holy Spirit today. Begin with verse 15, and I'm reading 
the politically correct version, that is the Holman Standard uh, version of the Bible, all right? Paul says, pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. I think all of us could readily say amen and amen to what the apostle says. And while it was true of his day, it is as if we read the front page of the paper today. We live in a day that is evil. And he says, therefore, it's important for us to be wise in the way we walk. So he says, don't be foolish. That's the opposite, obviously, of being wise. But understand what the Lord's will is. If I had a nickel for every time somebody asked me as a pastor and as a leader, could you help me understand the will of God, I would be a rich man today. But I'll also tell you that as I have experienced that journey with folks, that I've also come to conclude that people know more the will of God than they're willing to live. In fact, I would say not just people, but I know more the will of God than I'm often willing to live. And Paul says, I want you to know what the will of the Lord is. And the verses that follow help us to understand something, at least of one of the most important things in the will of God for his children. Verse 18. And don't get drunk with wine and all that God's Baptist said. Well, it used to, we used to always say amen to that. A little weak in this crowd. Don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless actions. But be filled. And those of you who are Greek scholars, I'm sure that's all the students that are here today. He really could be translated like this. Let the Holy Spirit fill you and keep on filling you. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, seeking and making music to the Lord in your heart. That's what we've done a moment ago. And giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. That's one long sentence, but a powerful sentence for us today. Being a leader of Baptist, I, uh, one of the leaders of Baptist, certainly in Oklahoma, I have the privilege of being in a different church every Sunday. I have the privilege of being in the churches where, uh, <laughs> by the way, when the singer, the song leader gets up to sing, he's got a ring around his head where the John Deere hat fit over the week. And he gets up and says to her, turn to him number such and such, and he usually just waves his arm up and down when he leaves the singing. And then I have the privilege of being in some of the great churches of Oklahoma where they have great choirs and great praise music, and, and it's a wonderful experience. But I can tell you, as I go from church to church, I have discovered that far too often I find, not only in the congregation, but in the heart of the pastor, oftentimes a sense of spiritual defeat and a lack of expectation of what the holy God of heaven wants to do when we get together to worship. And in fact, I find that carnality has creaked into the church and that carnality oftentimes rules in the lives of spiritual, so-called spiritual leaders in the church and in those who sit in the pews. Now that is not so much as an indictment as it is a simple statement of reality. And I cry to God day after day as a leader of Oklahoma Baptist, and I can't talk about Alabama or Georgia Baptist, but I know Oklahoma Baptist. And I can tell you without question that if there is a need in our churches, it is for a revisiting and a refreshing from the Holy Spirit of God in the lives of spiritual leaders and those who are sitting in the pew of our churches that really a good sloshing of a new work of the Holy Spirit would be a great thing to happen in our churches. Fact is, as I have, as you have, read from some of those who study us, for example, George Barna. George Barna said that uh, after doing 15 years of digging around in Southern Baptist life and in the American church, he said, I have come to this conclusion that the greatest concern and the greatest need among, among the American church is for God 
to grow up spiritual leaders. And I underscore that word spiritual. Uh, we have many leaders among us. The question is, are you, am I one who is filled with the Holy Spirit and who is leading from a perspective of spiritual leadership, not just what we've learned by reading in books somewhere and what we have experienced in studying the secular world. I'm convinced that Barna is right. We desperately need in the American church and in Southern Baptist life a reinfusing of the power of the Holy Spirit in our leaders so that they are not just leaders, but we are spiritual leaders. John Mark Terry said um, in his book, a statement on church evangelism, he said, we have the best uh, materials and media, media and methods, but lack spiritual power. Christians of the apostolic era had none of the advantages. They didn't even have the New Testament. Still, they turned the Roman Empire upside down. Now, a reading of the book of Acts would bring you to that same conclusion. That while we have all the methodologies and all of the materials and all of the ability to impact the world, the fact of the matter is that when you measure it, I'm not sure that you could say we are having a greater impact in our day with all of that than was done in the New Testament era when they had nothing but a fresh experience of the Holy Spirit of God's work on their lives. Now, please do not misunderstand me. I am not this morning calling for a second work of grace. I'm calling for a second, third, tenth, twentieth, and a hundredth work of grace. I'm simply saying that there is a great need for you and for me you are going to be the, the new leaders of the church in the centuries that, in, and the decades that come. And for those of us who are not quite ready to hang it up yet, that we are in desperate need of God's Holy Spirit to do a fresh work among us. And that is exactly what I am calling for in your life and mine today. Now, I really want to answer just three quick questions. First of all, I want to speak to you about why do we need the filling of the Holy Spirit? Why should you, why should I be filled with the Holy Spirit of God? I want to talk about for a moment, what do I mean by the filling of the Holy Spirit? Better yet, what does the Scripture mean by the filling of the Holy Spirit? And lastly, simply how can I and how can you be filled with the Holy Spirit? First of all, why should I be filled with the Holy Spirit of God? Well, I can tell you it's rather simple. Uh, really two thoughts. The first one is this. It is a command of God to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul, writing in Ephesians, uses the imperative. He says, I, I want you to understand you are to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. It is, a, it is emphatic. It is strong. It is not something that you and I can say, well, when I get around to it, I'll let that happen in my life. Or whenever I decide I want to let it happen, I will. Paul says, no. The Holy Spirit says to you through the Holy Word of God, you are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It is a, it is an imperative for your life and for mine. And the way he says it is rather clear. He says it is something that is in the present tense. It is to be done at every moment and at every hour in your spiritual journey. You know, some people get the idea that, that, that high spiritual moments are to only happen when you're on the mountaintop. And some people have the idea that this business of really being in tune with the Holy Spirit of God is only something for the high muckety-mucks who are the great leaders among us. I don't read that anywhere in the Bible. What I read and what I hear Paul saying in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18 is that this is something for every Christian. The moment we were converted, we were, we had the gift of the Holy Spirit placed in our lives. We were baptized and immersed in the Holy Spirit. But Paul says there is a need for a constant refreshing and restoring and renewing work of the Holy Spirit in your life and in my life. So it is not an option. It's not something that I, I wait to happen. It is not a second work of grace. It is rather a dramatic and dynamic event that, that goes on forever and forever in my spiritual walk as I walk with Jesus every day. In fact, go back to the book of Acts again. 
You begin in the second chapter, the Holy Spirit of God comes down, fills every believer on the day of Pentecost. But you go to the chapters that follow and you will find again and again and again that God's Holy Spirit revisits His people and reinfuses His power in them. And again and again they are saying, Oh God, will you come afresh in our hearts so that we might have your power in our lives? Oh, I would say to you, that's the prayer that you need to pray. It's the prayer I need to pray. That every day as I, as I get up, I, I need to say, Oh God, would you today... And it's not a good enough for yesterday, not good enough for tomorrow, but today, would you come down in my life? Would you sit on the throne of my heart? Would you, oh God, fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I might walk in your power and anointing through this day? Now, there's a second reason, I believe, why you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. First of all, simply, it's His command. But it is evident in this text that if you want to have the power of God in many places in your life, that the Holy Spirit must fill you. You say, well, what are you talking about? Well, in the verses that follow, he simply is saying that when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, guess what? Your, your worship is going to take on a whole new dynamic. As you worship in singing and praising and, and speaking in hymns and spiritual songs, God's Holy Spirit is going to infuse your worship experience, both private and whenever you come together corporately. I mean, folks, you, you understand the difference. You've heard singers sing, and then you've heard singers sing, sing spiritually infused with power of God. And it is a wholly different thing. You've been in worship experiences where you walk in and you walk out and you say, well, that was uh, an experience. And then you've been in worship experiences where you walked in and before you ever got in the room, there was a sense of the presence of holy God in that place. And when the people of God began to sing and they began to praise Him and they began to pray and they began to preach and teach, you walked out saying, oh, listen, I have not just been in a place where there was worship. I was in a place where I experienced holy God in a new and fresh way. God's Holy Spirit visited us today. And I want to tell you, that's what happens when you are filled with the Holy Spirit of God. God does a fresh work and His church when it is filled with the Holy Spirit of God, there is a fresh dynamic when we come together in worship. In the next few verses that follow, Paul says, listen, you, you want to you wanna love your wife the way you're supposed to love her? You, wife, you want to submit? I know that's an ugly word, but I'm going to use it anyway because it's biblical. You want to submit to your husband in the way you're supposed to do? You want to love like Christ loved the church? You want to line up behind Christ the way we are to line up behind Him? He says, then here's what you need. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. i got to tell you something. Paul and I are going, to, are going to celebrate our 40th anniversary this June. Now, we got married when we was about 12 years old, you understand. But I had to tell you, those days when we have walked in the filling of the Holy Spirit, our marriage has been incredible. And in those days when we've walked in the flesh, it's been horrible, you understand. You say, well, I didn't know that there were those times in marriage. Well, hello, wake up, smell the roses. I wish it was good every day, but it isn't, all right? There are days that Paula has been challenged to live with me. I've never had that experience with her, and that's honest, but I'm going to tell you, she's had some tough days. But when that little woman walks in the fullness of the Spirit, she can love me anyway and line up with me. Listen, Paul is saying the filling of the Holy Spirit is a requirement for you to have the right relationship in marriage. And by the way, the right relationship between parents and their children and children and the parents in chapter 6. And it is a way to have a right relationship in your work life. He said when you're full of the Holy Spirit, you can, you can work in a relationship with your boss and your boss with you. And you can work in such a relationship that you can do great things to the glory of God in any circumstance when you are full of the Holy Spirit. By the way, you go into other passages in the text and I would tell you that, that for example, Paul says you want to have power in your ministry. You want to be able to, whether it's in uh, preaching or whether it's leading a Sunday school or whether it's leading small groups or whether it's out there working somewhere in, uh, with those who are indigent, whatever ministry you have, you want to have, you want to have power in your ministry. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, then you just need to understand God's the one that gifts you. He's the one that calls you to ministry. But listen, He is the one that empowers you by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Many of us go about our ministry doing our whole hum stuff, and I want to tell you, God never intended for ministry to be boring and ho-hum. And when you're full of the Holy Spirit, you don't have to worry about your ministry being boring. You don't have to wonder what you need to do. You just follow His leadership. He will empower you to do your ministry and your work. You want to be able to witness? You know, I, I, I was a pastor for 28 years, and, I, and part of my whole ministry was trying to pump up lifeless Christians to get them to go out and tell somebody about Jesus. You know what? I'm going to tell you, I've never met a Christian full of the Holy Spirit I ever had to pump up to do anything. I've never had to convince a church full of the Holy Spirit they need to go tell the world about a Savior. And by the way, I've never had to pump up a preacher or a pastor. I mean, i, I got to tell you, folks, I, I am absolutely astounded at the number of pastors who never go tell anybody about Jesus. When you're full of the Holy Spirit, nobody has to get you fired up and fired off on all cylinders. I want to tell you, you, you have a desire to go out and find somebody. You'll witness to, to the dog that walks by. You just want to tell somebody about Jesus when you're full of the Holy Spirit of God. Well, I need to press on. That's why you need to be full of the Holy Spirit. Let's talk a minute about, about just what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul gives us a picture here. He says, don't be drunk with wine, because it'll lead to, to all kinds of reckless action. The picture, of course, is that a person that is filled with wine is a person who is controlled by wine, influenced by wine. Their actions are directed by wine. We've got plenty of Baptists that, that know how to experience that. But I want to talk to you about the picture that he gives. It has nothing to do with that. On the other side, he is saying, if you want to understand what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit, that's what he's talking about. Being controlled, influenced, and directed by the Holy Spirit of God. To be full of the Holy Spirit is to have your life surrendered and under the control of the direction of the Holy Spirit every moment of every day. So that he guides you in what you do. He empowers you in what you are all about. This word is also used the idea of filling. It is like um, I drive by a uh, Lake Hefner on my way to, into the office, and and when I come home, and usually when I come home in the summertime, there are sailboats on Lake Hefner there in Oklahoma City, and their sails are filled with wind. By the way, we have plenty of wind in Oklahoma. All right. Some of you say, well, you got some hot air that made it to New Orleans just today. Listen. It is the power, the Holy Spirit of God is like filling up the sail of a sailboat. That's exactly what happens when He fills you up, when He fills me up. He is empowering us. He is pushing us along. He is giving us the energy, the strength, and the power to accomplish the work that He has called us to do. Uh, this word is also used to, to talk about the idea of permeating. Um, I like this because it helps me think about something that I'm going to experience in not too, too distant future here in just a few minutes. Uh, let me use an illustration that will help you understand this idea of permeating. Uh, I grew up on a farm in my elementary years in, uh, in Skytook, Oklahoma. And, um, and come fall, we would have something called hog killing time. Now, these folks right here would understand that. You young folk, you're going, what is that? I thought you buy ham at... Uh, Grocery store. Well, we had hog killing, all right? We would kill the hog, gut the hog, and then Dad would butcher the hog, and he would cut off those hams, and he would use salt. He'd rub all around over that ham, and then he'd hang it in the smokehouse, and that salt would cure. It would keep it from decaying, and it would cure that ham. And then, guess what? When it got cured, we'd go out and slice it off, and we didn't, we hadn't heard about cholesterol, and we'd take it, put it in a frying pan, Mama would, make some make some biscuits, and then we'd have some red-eye gravy. You can get that, by the way, at Cracker Barrel, and I'm pretty hungry thinking about it, all right? And I've watched this. I've done this. We'd take that biscuit, and we'd sop it in that grease off of that cured ham. Now, why didn't that ham just go rotten? Because the salt permeated it and kept it from decay. It went all the way inside, all the way down to the bone. Let me tell you, when the Holy Spirit of God fills your life, that's exactly what happens. He permeates every part of your life. 
He permeates your thought life. He permeates your, your, uh, your ministry life. He permeates your family life. Every part of you is permeated by the Holy Spirit of God whenever He fills you up to overflowing. And that's why Paul says, listen, I want you to be filled every day. Keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Now, the last thing is this. Then how can I be filled with the Holy Spirit? Paul implies it, but doesn't give us a direct picture here. And I want to use two words. You know, in Baptist circles, we often think the filling of the Holy Spirit would be something like this. I'd walk the aisle of the church and get on my knees and I'd rededicate my life to God. Now, the only problem with that is in most of our churches, rededicating our lives really means nothing more than rededicating our flesh. We simply say, God, I'm going to go, I'm going to get up from here. I feel bad about where I've been. I mean, you can even repent and say, God, I want to repent. And you go out and you say, I'm going to do better. That usually means I'm going to try harder. The only problem is trying harder in the Christian journey usually nets us about what our flesh can get done. You know, Paul said it like this in Galatians. He says, walk by the Spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Now, he put it in the right order. Walk by the Spirit. That's the issue. That's the important part of that verse. So it's not rededicating our flesh that makes us uh, better or that causes us to experience the filling of the Holy Spirit. Now, I would say that the first word is this. It is empty yourself of you and sin and everything that keeps you from allowing the Holy Spirit to do his work in you. Um, Paul and I uh, adopted our both our children. They're adults now, but... Um, when we adopted our daughter, our son was seven years old. I never will forget it. A lady in our church was a social worker, and she came to us and said, Listen, um, in order for you to adopt another child, we need to come check your house out. need to see if, if your house is big enough to handle another child. And so um, we, we need, I need to come out to your house. Well, of course, what do you do when somebody's going to come and go through every room of your house? You clean every inch of it. Now, this little woman of mine does that anyway. I mean, she is clean, Della Cream clean, you understand. And so we went through the house. But now listen, every one of us have a closet or a drawer that we put everything in that we don't know where to put it, okay? And, and it is usually very cluttered. It's bad. In fact, you usually have to stand at the door of that closet with your foot and push it closed in order to get the door shut. So we did... We did what I think any parent would do. We said to our son, now, son, seven years old now, we said, son, whenever Judy comes to our house and, and, and she goes through our house, do not open this closet door. It'll kill her. Everything will fall out. She gets to our house. First thing she does is says, well, Adrian uh, would really like, why don't you show me through your house? I want to see where your little brother or sister might be going to stay. Now, I want to ask you, where do you think that little <laughs> took her? Very first thing. Yeah, I took her to that closet, opened that door, everything fell out. She didn't make it to the rest of the house. We had to take her to the hospital. Okay, that's a preacher out of stress. Uh, that's... You get what I'm saying? Here's what happens. Many of us cannot be full of the Holy Spirit. Now, I didn't say he's not in us. He is in us, you understand. we got all the Holy Spirit we're ever going to get whenever we get saved. But I'm talking about his influence, his control in our lives. We cannot be full of the Holy Spirit because we got a bunch of other stuff in closets in our lives. And we say, God, you can have every other part, but this is mine. Don't bug me. Let me tell you something. When the Lord Jesus saved you, you were bought with a price. You are not your own. He owns every part of you, lock, stock, and barrel, and he has a right to every room in your life. And for him to fill you, you have to empty yourself. Last thing is surrender. And that's the picture here. It's in the passive mood. He says, I want you to understand, I want you to keep on every day being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's in the imperative. You need to know that this is a responsibility. I call upon you. I command you to be filled with the Holy Spirit, but it's in the passive mood. And the idea is, let the Holy Spirit of God fill you. Now, how are you going to do that? You surrender to Him. Holy Spirit of the living God, I surrender. Clean out all the stuff that's in my life, the sin that separates us. God, Holy Spirit, come down in my life. 
have full sway in every room of my heart, in every corner of my life. Holy Spirit of God, I surrender to you. I simply want what you want in my life. And you tell me, whether it's a church that runs 50 or 5,000 that doesn't deserve a spiritual leader like that. What seminary class does not deserve a professor like that? What convention does not deserve an executive director like that? Surrendered, yielded, filled to overflowing with the Spirit of the living God. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you. What an incredible privilege it is for me to look into the face of of men and women who you are using in a remarkable way to impact the world with the gospel. I thank you for the professors who stand and teach and equip so that the students may go to every part of this world carrying the name of Jesus. I simply pray, oh God, would you fall afresh upon us. May your Holy Spirit do a dynamic work in us so that we might be all that you want us to be, to bring glory and honor to the name of Christ, that we might become like Jesus, and that the fruit of the Holy Spirit might be produced in and through us. For it is in your wonderful name we pray. Amen. God bless you.